Hey, how's it going? Parker Walbeck here with FullTimeFilmmaker.com and today I'm gonna to be giving you my initial thoughts on our all new $14,000 Mac Pro and comparing the video editing performance to my current $14,000 iMac Pro. And I'll also be sharing with you the specs that I got and what I recommend getting for video editors. So first, my initial thoughts. This thing is big and it is heavy. Weighing in at 40 pounds, there's a reason why they have an option to buy wheels because it's not easy to move around. The packaging, as always, was beautiful. It comes with the computer computer, a magic mouse, and a keyboard. The keyboard has a two-tone look compared to the previous one that was all black, and I think I like that better. As for the computer itself, the design and build quality is tremendous. Everyone's making fun of the cheese grater look, and I agree it is kind of funny looking, but after seeing it in person, it's actually really sharp looking, and even when you take off the casing, the internals look really pretty too. And being able to take off the casing allows to easily upgrade internals down the road, so in theory, this investment should last for many years. Now, as for functionality, on the top here is the power button and two USB-C Thunderbolt ports, along with the latch that you can switch halfway and lift to reveal the internals. Then on the back, you have two more USB-C Thunderbolt ports, along with the headphone jack and two USB ports. And then on the bottom of the back, you have four more USB-C Thunderbolt ports, an HDMI port, and dual 10 gigabyte Ethernet ports. So no complaints as far as the functionality, other than I wish it had four USB ports like my iMac Pro, because I found that I do end up using all four of those. So now now only having two, I'll probably just have to buy some more dongles. Thank you, Apple. As far as specs go, I had mentioned on my iMac Pro review two years ago that I maxed out that machine and that that was overkill. And if I could go back, I would have scaled back on some of the upgrades that I chose. So with this Mac Pro, I tried to only upgrade as much as I felt I would need for my editing workflow. Now the base Mac Pro starts at six grand. I then upgraded the processor from eight cores to 16 cores. My iMac Pro has 18 cores, but after doing tests with lower core models, I found that there wasn't much difference in performance specifically within Premiere Pro, which is the main software that I use for video editing. And because Premiere can only really effectively use about 12 to 14 cores at any one time, there just isn't a reason for me to get much more than that. Also, it's important to note that the speed of each core goes down when you have more cores. So getting 16 cores instead of say 28 cores means that each core will have 3.2 gigahertz speed versus 2.5 on the 28 core option. Or compare that to my iMac Pro that has two more cores, but each core has a speed of 2.5 3 gigahertz, so 12 cores is probably that sweet spot for getting the most for your money, but again, I went with 16 cores for a little buffer. Moving down to the next spec is memory. I upgraded mine to 96 gigs of RAM. My current iMac Pro has 128 gigs of RAM, so I actually downgraded this spec from my iMac Pro, and that's because after having run tests with my daily workflow, the most RAM I could get my computer to use while running Premiere Pro, After Effects, Photoshop, streaming YouTube videos, having multiple tabs open in Chrome, and screen recording, I could only get up to around 70 gigabytes used at any one time, so 96 gigabytes gives me plenty of buffer, especially for my workflow. And in reality, I've never actually used all those things at once. So the 48 gigabyte option would probably be enough for most editors, but for only $300 more, I doubled it just to be safe. And for those asking why anyone would need 1.5 terabytes of RAM, those are for businesses that are like server hosting and are running way more than just one person's editing workflow. But moving on now to the next spec is graphics card. I upgraded mine from eight gigabytes to 32 gigabytes of HBM2 memory. Compare that to my iMac Pro that has 60 gigabytes of memory, which was probably plenty for what I do, but the Mac Pro just didn't have a 16 gigabyte option, and I didn't want to downgrade from where I'm currently at, so I went up to the 32 gigabytes. I also wanted HBM2 over GDDR5, as it's a newer, faster technology, and even though this upgrade is overkill, there are certain functions within the video editing process, like noise reduction, that could take advantage of that added power. But if there was one upgrade that I was iffy about on the extra money, it was this one. Moving on to the last spec is the storage. It comes with 256 gigabytes of SSD storage, which in my opinion isn't enough. You'll run out of space to store files on your computer really quick. I'd recommend getting at least one terabyte. My iMac Pro has four terabytes, which I thought would be overkill, but my team and I pass a lot of files back and forth between Dropbox, and I like to use the Dropbox desktop app to host all those files locally, which means I need a lot of storage space on my computer to be able to access all my Dropbox files. So I actually almost filled up all my four terabytes, and so I opted to get the eight terabyte storage option for this Mac Pro. 
again, not a necessary upgrade, not going to help my editing speed, just a convenience upgrade for my file management workflow. As far as the afterburner card, I think this would have been another overkill upgrade. My workflow isn't too intense. The great specs I already bought should be enough to handle my workflow just fine. So there you have it. Those are the specs that I got that added up to $14,000, which is the same price that I paid for my iMac Pro two years ago. Biggest difference being that the Mac Pro does not come with a display, whereas the iMac Pro comes with the built-in 5K 27 inch retina display. So that's the only other cost to factor in when getting a Mac Pro is that you'll need to buy a display. And yes, I did order the $6,000 6K XDR display, but it's back ordered, so I won't get it for another month, but I'll give you my thoughts on that once it does arrive. But I now wanna run a few performance tests to compare my iMac Pro to the Mac Pro to see if for similar prices we get any added performance for video editing, or if you might as well go with the iMac Pro with a built-in screen. So here we have opened up in Premiere Pro with a red 6K clip on the timeline. I also did tests on other 4K files like DJI drone footage, and both of these machines played that flawlessly, so we stepped it up to 6K raw footage to start seeing any performance struggle. Our first test we'll run is to compare playback on the timeline at full 6K resolution. As you can see, they both play back pretty well. However, I have the dropped frame indicator turned on that shows that they both dropped a few frames, so probably only playing 22 or 23 out of those 24 frames per second. So it can almost play back the full 6K resolution, which right away made me a little bit disappointed that I still can't get flawless full K 6K resolution playback. But when I put them both to half resolution, they play back flawlessly, no dropped frames, which I usually add on half resolution anyway. So that's not a huge deal. But for 14 grand, I was hoping we'd get 6K playback at full res. Keep in mind though, that it's not just the computer's fault. Premiere isn't fully optimized for these specs. And I ran the same test on Final Cut Pro X and I got a smooth playback at full K6 resolution. Unfortunately, I and many professional editors prefer Premiere Pro over Final Cut, so be aware that the full glory of these specs won't manifest on Premiere because of the lack of optimization of Adobe software. Next, I tested out the rendering speed. To render out a one minute color graded 6K clip, it took the Mac Pro 25 seconds and the iMac Pro 33 seconds, so about a 25% speed improvement for the Mac Pro. I then tested out exporting speeds, both exporting a one minute 6K clip to a YouTube 4K preset, and the Mac Pro did it in 70 seconds and the iMac Pro did it in 95 seconds. So again, about a 25% speed improvement on the Mac Pro. And my guess is the reason why it's 25% faster is because of the faster speeds per core on the Mac Pro. Next, I tested out a heavy video effect like warp stabilizer and I thought the Mac Pro would again be 25% faster. However, after stabilizing a five second 6K clip, it took both of them about two and a half minutes with the iMac Pro only being a few seconds behind. So it's not much of a difference. So again, a little disappointed for me to see minimal improvement on the Mac Pro in this test. Now, obviously tests will vary from software to software and effect to effect, but it looks like the general consensus is that some things there's no noticeable difference and in other things, the Mac Pro was about 25% faster, which isn't a lot. And considering this is two years newer of a product for about the same amount of money minus a display, I'd say that that was slightly disappointing to me, but the specs are pretty similar and they are specced out past what Premiere Pro can even fully be able to utilize. So with beast computers like these, it starts to become more of a software issue than a computer spec issue. So is it worth $14,000 for most people and for most video editors specifically? No, it's definitely overpriced for the specs and the specs are definitely overkill. I think a sweet spot for most high-end video editors is going to be picking up an iMac Pro with around 10 cores and 64 gigs of RAM pricing at around $6,000. If you already have an iMac Pro, is it worth up upgrading to a Mac Pro. I don't think so. They seem pretty similar in spec for the price, but you get a 5K display with the iMac Pro. So I think for video editors, I'd probably recommend the iMac Pro over the Mac Pro, unless you're planning on maxing this out way more than I did and or wanting the ability to upgrade the specs down the road. Like for example, adding in the afterburner card, which may allow me to play back that 6K full res file flawlessly, but I'm not sure because I don't know if Premiere is a supported third-party application. I doubt it and so I didn't take the risk 
disk and just cut my resolution in half while I edit and save myself two grand. Now, do I regret buying this? Well, since it's not a significant upgrade from my current computer, it's definitely not something that I needed. So there is a little regret there. It will be nice to have as a second powerhouse machine for our new studio. So I'll probably still keep it, but hopefully this was at least valuable for all of you to learn from these tests and help you know where to save some money when you're buying a computer. Knowing what I know now, are there any specs that I'd change? Honestly, I think I could have done without the graphic card upgrade at $2,400. I could be wrong, but I don't think there's a lot of use for upgrading that for the type of work that I do. And as you saw in the test that I ran, doubling my graphic card from my iMac Pro didn't affect any of those tests we ran. So clearly it's not something that Premiere uses much. So that would be the one upgrade that I think I could go without. And the follow-up question I always get to that is, why don't you just build your own PC and how much would a custom PC cost for the same specs as the Mac Pro? Now, my brother and I actually did build our own PC at one point, but it took several weeks of research and buying and building things. And then the PC had a lot of issues that we had to learn how to troubleshoot. And in the end, it cost us more time than it saved us in speed improvement and money. And to me, that is worth paying Apple a premium for their products that work much smoother than any I could build. Also, I'm just not a handy guy. But for those who are looking to build their own computers, for similar specs to a base model Mac Pro, I put a link in the description to a great article breaking down what it would cost to build your own PC with similar specs to the base model. And they projected that it would be around $3,700. Again, that doesn't factor in the Apple design and build quality, the Apple software, Apple reliability and warranty. So yes, you can save quite a bit of money by doing it yourself, but it will cost you in other areas. Now, an interesting side test that we did, we also ran some tests on a maxed out 16 inch MacBook Pro with a 2.4 gigahertz eight core processor, 64 gigs of RAM, eight gigabyte graphic card and eight terabytes of storage. That comes in at $6,000. Keep in mind, if you just get the base one terabyte of storage, which wouldn't affect your editing speeds, it would come in under $4,000. But here were the results we got with that machine. Playback on the 6K clip dropped frames in full resolution, and it also dropped frames at half resolution, but it played back flawlessly at a fourth resolution. And the same one minute clip rendered out took 65 seconds compared to 33 seconds on the iMac Pro and 25 seconds on the Mac Pro, so about two times slower. And exporting out a one minute clip took about 170 seconds compared to 70 seconds on the Mac Pro and 95 seconds on the iMac Pro. So again, about two times slower. So not bad for a $4,000 machine. Definitely slower, but fast enough for most, a much better bang for buck, and it has the advantage of being mobile so you can take it with you on the road. Biggest drawback would be how loud the fans are on the MacBook Pro compared to the nearly silent fans on both the Mac Pro and iMac Pro. But there you have it. Those are my thoughts on the new Mac Pro. Again, it's not for everyone, but for high-end creative professionals, definitely a great option. For most though, I'd probably recommend getting a MacBook Pro or an iMac Pro for a better bang for buck. Also, as I mentioned, I did buy the 6K XDR display to go along with my Mac Pro. So I'll be giving you my thoughts on that in the future when it arrives. Lastly, to learn more about optimizing your editing workflow and for more help choosing a computer for editing, we have a full video in our course, Full-Time Filmmaker, discussing what to look for in a computer for video editing. And I teach my full editing workflow in both Premiere Pro and Final Cut Pro X. So I'll make sure to check that out. Links are in the description to join our growing community of video creators or to see a preview of what the course is like. You can watch our free one hour filmmaking training by clicking over here. And lastly, guys, don't forget to subscribe for more content like this. And if you have any further questions, please let me know.